Hello and welcome to the webinar, Implications of COVID on Future Lending Practices. The personal, commercial and economic impact of the COVID-19 outbreak has been unprecedented around the world. Although now there has been a small light at the end of this tunnel, the pandemic and its effects remain top of mind for many. The financial services industry, among many other sectors, have had to change in response to current times. The need for businesses to evolve in order to manage the fast moving unknown variables surrounding the pandemic and its aftermath has never been more crucial. Our session will explore the implications of the pandemic on future lending practices. We will specifically focus on recent evolutions in practice that will extend beyond COVID, managing the short term impact of the pandemic. Our panel will also discuss what the new normal will look like and what will be the challenges and opportunities for the lending market. My name is Haveen and I'm one of the editors here at The Legal 500. And before I introduce our expert panelists for today, I would first like to introduce our moderator, Mark Thorne, Head of Banking Capital Markets at Dublin, Dylan Yusuf. Mark has broad experience across banking and capital markets, corporate mergers, acquisitions, corporate finance, financial services. Before overseeing the banking and capital markets, he spent 16 years serving as managing partner at Dylan Yusuf. His corporate and corporate finance practice includes experience in public and private acquisitions, joint ventures, partnerships, and restructurings. In the finance area, his emphasis is on local and cross-border NPL acquisition financing and asset structured financing, repackaging capital markets and complex fund financing. Welcome, Mark. I saw you gave a quick wave before. Good afternoon, everybody. Now I would like to warmly welcome our expert panel, who as industry leaders will be sharing their valuable insight today. We have quite a large panel of speakers, so I will try and be brief. In no particular order, we have joining us today, Colin Green, Head of Private Debt in Private Markets Group at Union Bancare Prevair. Colin joined ACPI Investments in 2015, when in 2018 it was acquired by UBP. Before this, he was a partner at an emerging markets credit hedge fund. This fund was a spin-off from Tudor Investment Corporation where Colin also worked. Before Colin joined the spin-off, he had been responsible for the recovery of a portfolio of distressed and defaulted emerging market loans and bonds, which the investment had moved to a side pocket following the global financial crisis. Welcome Colin, it's great to have you here today. Thank you, uh, hello everybody. Also joining us is Nessa O'Reardon, Director at AIB Banking. Nessa has extensive experience across the full range of corporate banking solutions, including, including acquisition and MBO finance, CAPEX and development financing and working capital financing. Her corporate clients range from mid-scale um, owner-managed businesses to semi-states, large plus and multinationals. Currently, Nessa is responsible for the hotels, leisure and transport sectors within IAB corporate banking. Great to have you here with us, Nessa. Hi, everybody. Also on the panel, we have Chris Wilson, Chief Executive, Fairfield Real Estate Finance. For those who don't know, Chris actually co-founded the company back in May 2016. Before that, he spent several years at Jeffrey's Loan Core Europe um, turning it into one of Europe's leading alternative lenders. Before that, Chris was managing partner and head of Brookfield Financial in the United States. He has over 24 years um, commercial real estate lending experience, and we are happy to have him on the panel today. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Harvey. Next, we have John Hugh Colloran, partner at Dylan Eustace. John is a crucial member of the banking capital markets team at his firm. He advises on domestic and international financial institutions and corporate clients on a broad range of banking and finance transactions. His practice areas include secured and unsecured findings, bilateral and syndicated lending, security and intercreditor packages, tax-based lending structures, acquisition finance, general corporate lending structures, that's just to name a few. With such a busy schedule, John still finds time to give lectures at the Law Society of Ireland, regularly giving presentations to bankers and banking lawyers. It's lovely to have you with us here, John. Thanks, Arvin. Hi, everybody. Last but not least, we have Connor Kivini, partner at Dylan Eustis. Connor acts on a wide range of banking transactions for financial institutions and corporates. 
for, um, for both British and foreign. Connor's lending experience extends to bilateral club and syndicated lending arrangements, both secured and unsecured. He has a great deal of experience acting for sellers, purchasers, and finances of loan portfolios. Connor has also advised extensively in the area of aircraft finance, including acting for aircraft lessors and finances. Welcome, Connor. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Harvey. Now the formal introductions are out of the way, we would just like to give a special thanks to Dylan Eustace for supporting this webinar and making this event possible. Before I hand over the reins to Mark, I just wanted to remind our audience that um, if you have any questions throughout the session, you can write them in our Q&A boxes, which you should be able to find somewhere on your screen. Um, with that being said, I will now hand over to our moderator, Mark. Thanks, Harveen, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm delighted on behalf of Dylan Eustace to welcome you all to our session uh, this afternoon in conjunction with uh, Legal 500. Uh, the emergence of COVID in late 2019 and early 2020 has had an unprecedented impact across the global and indeed local economy. When we turned on our TV screens in the early part of last year, noting the outbreak of a virus in China, Little did we know that less than two months later, the Irish economy would be put into lockdown and the following 15 month period would be marked by a series of localized geographical and sectoral lockdowns across the Irish economy. The phrase unprecedented is bandied about a lot frequently used, but it seems hardly significant or stark enough to describe the happenings over the last 15 months. The pandemic, unlike previous crises, has had an impact almost universally across sectors. And this includes obviously finance and lending, both in the context of borrower and indeed lender activity. This has seen massive state intervention by way of direct financial supports, moratoria on repossessions and evictions and enforcement, relaxation of company law requirements, and also a swift and quite a dramatic move by consumers and businesses alike to an online and virtual world. Despite all of this, turmoil and throughout the period, financial institutions and advisors have managed to continue to operate in this new virtual arena and address the various challenges with which they've been faced. Some of these will have a more long lasting impact and become part of what everyone describes now as the new normal. The long term impact will as always vary by sector, but probably more than ever, there will be winners and losers. In today's presentations, we're going to look to examine the impact on lending over the last 15 months and look forward in the next period to see what the implications are for the future lending across the Irish economy. In terms of agenda, we're going to hear initially from John, Hugh and Connor on some of the more practical implications around completion of transactions during this period and how parties have worked around them and adapted their practices into the future. We'll then have a panel session where each of our experts will bring their perspective to the short and longer term implications on the market. So without further ado, I will hand you across to John, Hugh. Thanks for that, Mark, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Connor and I are going to speak to you briefly about some of the workarounds and the changes in practice that we've been seeing since March of last year to deal with the, the challenges posed by distancing and travel restrictions. And, and we look at how we expect these practices to evolve as, as restrictions are lifted. Most of the challenges we've seen have been around the, the execution of transaction documents in, in the context of remote working. Uh, on, on witnessing, this continues to be required where deeds are executed by individuals and by attorneys. And best practice there is, is still that the witness must be in the same physical location as the secretary. It can't be done now remotely by, by video conferencing or the like. We did see some relaxation of the practice that a witness uh, should not have a close connection with the signatory, but we don't see this as a, a long-term development and independence of witnesses will, will be sought again as restrictions lift. And there have been particular challenges around the, the execution, the requirement for Irish companies to execute deeds under seal. Uh, new COVID-19 related company legislation ha has brought in a temporary measure until the end of this year, uh, which makes execution under seal somewhat easier by uh, providing that the sealing and the signing by company officers can be on counter uh, separate counterparts rather, rather than on the same deed. This is, this is still very cumbersome uh, and by far the better workaround for clients has been to put in place powers of attorney, so appointing uh, individuals to execute documents on, on the company's behalf. Power of attorney itself uh, does not need to be sealed by the company and the attorney uh, need not apply the seal then when, when executing the deeds. Uh, looking then at the, the, the use of electronic signatures, uh, understandably there's been, been a huge interest in, in the use of e-signatures since uh, COVID-19 restrictions were introduced. 
However, there's a, a number of significant limitations to the use of these signatures in Ireland, which has meant that the, the execution of documents by wet ink signature still remains the most common practice on lending transactions. Uh, the, the, the most significant limitation is that the Irish legislation governing electronic signatures recognises various types of documents which cannot be executed in any circumstances using e-signatures. And these categories include, firstly, affidavits and, and statutory declarations, which would include declarations relating to property security, such as family home declarations. And secondly, then, it, it also includes documents by which any interest in real property is to be created, acquired, disposed of, or registered. So this last category rules out the use of e-signature for the execution of, of security over real property, as well as purchase deeds and leases in respect of real property. So currently, there's, there's no way around this limitation on e-signing. And, and, and then finally, certain registries, in particular the, the company's registration office, uh, the Property Registration Authority, and the Intellectual Property Office of Ireland still require wet signatures for, for particular forms or documents uh, that need to be filed with them. So as a result of these limitations, e-signing is, isn't an adequate or, or complete solution on most Irish uh, secured lending transactions. We have seen e-signing to be useful on, on certain unsecured lending transactions and for other agreements or variations that don't involve security. Uh, for those transactions, parties have generally favoured the kind of secure and password protected signatures that are e-signatures that are available through platforms like DocuSign and Adobe Sign, uh, which, which give the best level of or give a, a good level of authenticity authentication of, of those signatures. Uh, but due to the limitations on e-signing in Ireland, the, the simplest option for, for execution and exchange of documents on most secured lending transactions has continued to be execution by the parties in wet ink and then scanning and sending signed documents by email. So reforms are clearly needed to the Irish legislation governing e-signing in order to make it a more viable option across the board. And given the sudden and intense focus on the shortcomings of e-signing over the past 15 months, we, we would expect changes to be made to the law in the near future. I'll hand you over to Connor now to uh, update you on a, a couple of other developments of interest. Thanks very much, John Hugh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, continuing the theme, I, I just wanted to mention two other evolutions in practice, which we have been, I guess, more widely accepted and, and used as a consequence of the pandemic and the restrictions which have come with it. Both of the changes I'm going to mention have their origins pre-COVID, but COVID has brought into sharp relief really just how much more convenient these changes can make life for everybody. As many of you will already be aware, there are specific restrictions under Irish company law on a company's ability to provide financial assistance for the, purchase, for the purpose of an acquisition of its own shares, or indeed shares in its holding company, and also on a company's ability to enter into certain types of transactions for the benefit of its directors or connected parties. Thankfully, company law provides a mechanism which we call a summary approval procedure or an SAP for short, uh, which a company uh, can typically use in order to carry out what would otherwise be one of these prohibited activities. The various components for a valid SAP are detailed quite prescriptively in the relevant legislation, but they include a meeting of the board of directors of the relevant company and a solvency declaration by those directors. Historically, all or a majority of the directors have to be physically present in one place for the particular board meeting to occur. And the solvency declaration had to be a single document signed in wet ink by those directors. Now, for a number of years, it has been possible for the directors to participate in that board meeting by phone or video conference and for the declaration to be signed in counterparts. But that change in approach was being adopted I suppose, only slowly. Um, and the pandemic has changed that completely. Uh, and now uh, SAPs uh, are routinely completed uh, by directors in multiple locations and counterpart declarations are being used and widely accepted, which is good news for the practicalities of completing these types of transactions. The other evolution I just wanted to mention briefly was the, in the context of confirming guarantees and security. Again, as many of you will be aware, typically where a lender has advanced a loan and taken a guarantee or security as collateral, if there is some material change to the terms of the loan, the pre-existing security will be confirmed. Now, where that pre-existing security has been taken under a variety of different governing laws, usually because the assets are scattered across the map, historically, the typical approach would have been to take multiple deeds of confirmation, each one governed by a different governing law. The, that approach too has evolved, and there is now a widespread acceptance of the practice of using a single deed of confirmation containing multiple confirming clauses, each governed by a different law 
So the net effect at confirmation of all of these security under all relevant laws is still achieved, but with potentially far fewer documents which need to be prepared and signed. I think we can all see the attraction to this approach during pandemic lockdowns, but I think it's another example of a change in practice which is sensible and practical and will only continue to grow in use and acceptance once we have hopefully the pandemic well put behind us. So all of that being said, I'll, I'll pass it now back to Mark to bring us into the main event. Thanks, Connor, and, and indeed, John. Um, so, uh, turning to the, the main event, as Connor has described it, bigging us up for the afternoon. Uh, turning to the panel, um, maybe initially, can we give some views on the, the, the short term impacts that we've seen on, on, on existing credit lines and demand for new credit, risk appetite across those headings? Uh, Nasa, can you give us a, 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 an overview from the, your experience at AIB? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, year to date uh, in 2020, demand has been pretty strong um, and the, the numbers have held up pretty well in terms of, of new lending appetite. But once you start looking behind those numbers, you get a very different picture for different sectors. So you have those sectors that were um, who performed strongly or relatively neutral COVID impact, say healthcare, food manufacturing, uh, social housing. And there was a lot of pent up demand in those sectors uh, after a relatively quiet year last year. And we're seeing that starting to be released. So we're seeing good CapEx investment, um, investment in IT, infrastructure, supply chains, and also a reasonable amount of M&A activity. But then you look at the other side, which are those sectors that were very negatively impacted by COVID. So obviously leisure, student housing, retail, and the demand there, uh, we've seen fairly limited appetite. The focus really is on liquidity management. Um, we're looking at payment moratoria, covenant resets, that type of activity, rather than new lending activity. Um, property has also obviously been affected by things like an inability to, to do viewings and the construction lockdown. So a very mixed performance, depending on, on which sector you're looking at. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Nessa. And Chris, in, in, in maybe more focused sectorally, what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, we're um, property lenders, so we definitely have a narrower focus than uh, Nessa. Um, we lend in the UK and Ireland, and I've been in the US for most of the past year, so I have a good perspective on those three countries. Um, out of the three, Ireland's definitely been a laggard in terms of activity generally, um, and in terms of making a turn to a post-pandemic future. Um, the lockdowns in particular have caused uh, delays and uncertainty around new projects and have stifled deal making. We've seen the draws on our development loans lag well behind uh, the plan. Um, on the positive side, we expect a significant jump in activity as things normalize this summer. Um, but generally, the, the UK has been a much more active market for us in the first half of 2021. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chris. And, and Colin, in terms of your, your view on, on, on the impact of this in terms of trends, I'm the first person to have to unmute. Excellent. Um, for us, when we look at COVID, what we see is that there are three key messages. The first one is that it's accelerated almost all trends. So whatever was happening in 2019 has probably been accelerated. Now, I can think of two exceptions, gender equality and social mobility. But other than that, virtually everything has been accelerated. Everything that we lived with, how we work, where we shop, uh, all of these things have been accelerated. That's one message just to mention. And the second one is, and I think NASA has touched on this huge segmental dispersion. Some, there was a, a broad-based economic contraction, but some sectors have been accelerated and pushed forward in logistics and online shopping, et cetera. And the third key message is, we're gonna emerge, hopefully, we're gonna emerge from this health crisis in Europe this year we will be living with the impact of this pandemic for the next 10 years. And so, so for us, when we look at this thing, what did, and I think this is going to guide everything that I say for the rest of this panel. But when I look at credit lines and all of what happened there, the first thing that happened is that the pandemic slowed everything down. Everybody went to work at home. 
and, and slowed everything down, put sand in the machine, and that, that slowed down the availability of credit and all economic activity. And we're only going to start to see now the economy reopening, and in those sectors of the economy that were shut down, we'll see the demand for credit picking up again. And in terms of the, 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 the housing area and, and residential housing, uh, a key focus for you? Yes, a key focus for us. We're particularly active in financing mass market residential housing in England, in Spain, and in Ireland. Uh, we do build to rent, and we also do, we do housing, and we also do affordable housing. Uh, like everybody in Ireland knows what the story is there. There's a massive undersupply. Uh, the demand for credit in that sector is huge. Uh, credit has been constrained uh, as, as the economies are reopening and as building sites are reopening, planning applications are starting to come through. Uh, there's huge inflation in building costs and the demand for credit in this space over the next couple of years will be huge, not just in Ireland, but in other countries too. There's going to be a massive push to develop mass market residential housing all across Europe. Right. Um, and, uh, and and Connor, uh, what evidence are we seeing of these uh, you know, restrictions and or, or on sand in the machine? I think as Colin quite nicely put it, in terms of in, you know additional security delays in credit, and, and how we're starting to emerge. Yeah, I, so I really like that 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 sand in the machine analogy that that Colin used. I thought that was that was very appropriate. I mean, we've certainly seen uh, picking up on both Nessa and and Colin's points. I think we've certainly seen variations in approach by lenders, depending in particular on where on the sector that their borrower is, is operating in. Um, but I think to be fair, um, you know, our, our, our overall experience would be that you know, lenders have been, have been very supportive of their borrowers throughout the pandemic. Uh, again, Nessa touched on this. We, we've seen a lot of you know, covenant waivers, covenant resets, you know, changes to payment schedules, uh, payment terms. I mean, that's been a very common feature over the last number of months. And, and picking up, I think, on, on, on what Chris was saying, I mean, on the development side, uh, I mean, we're also now seeing lenders who are agreeing to fund cost overruns uh, that have arisen, you know, due to, you know, COVID restrictions and lockdowns and, you know, the, the increases in, in cost of building materials, which I think is, is, I think, very apparent throughout that particular sector. So generally speaking, uh, and again, John, you mentioned this, you know, activity levels are, are certainly increasing again. Uh, I think we've been surprised actually by the levels of activity of, of, of in the M&A space. Um, but I suppose our overall impression is that credit is absolutely available uh, and that cash is being deployed and, and increasingly so in, in recent weeks. So we're starting to see a, a, a thawing out, if you like, of, 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 of the economy and the, and the lending market. I mean, in terms of the, the dissipation of that of the kind of shorter term impact, Chris, what's your what's your view and how quickly we'll start to get back to that? So I, I think we're going to have strong economic growth across the board in the second half as a natural result to the unwind of the COVID restrictions. But uh, like Colin talked about uh, sectoral dispersion, I think we'll have sectoral disruption. We'll see supply shortages and inflation in, in certain areas that are affected by uh, the strong rebound. In, in the US, we're seeing huge increases in lumber prices. We're hearing reports of uh, chip shortages uh, across all kinds of products. Um, and that's part of this uh, sharp bounce back that we'll see. Um, in, in Ireland in particular, you know, I think the, the hotel sector faces another hit um, with without the benefit of the strong international tour season this year, hopefully domestic tourism will fill in some of the gaps, but you know, and we'll see, hopefully we'll see some international travelers in the late summer uh, and autumn, but it, it simply cannot replace the economic impact of the huge travel season that normally happens in the summer. Um, on the, the property side, um, we're already seeing uh, transaction volumes tick up and uh, generally the yields um, have held steady or come in a bit, uh, which is positive. Thanks, Chris. And Colin, would you, would you share that view in terms of second half of the year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're fortunate in Europe. Uh, the 
for us, the health crisis, which, you know, with a caveat around variants, et cetera, but we're going to emerge from this health crisis this year. Yeah, that's not the case in the developing world, but for us in Europe, that it's, and in North America, uh, uh, it's almost certainly, uh, almost certainly the case that we will emerge from the health crisis. But what we need to remember is we're going to be living with this COVID-19 for years and years to come. It's not going to go away. Uh, the second thing is that the segmental dispersion we keep talking about is going to remain. It's going to be huge. Some sectors will face COVID headwinds. When I think about COVID headwinds, I think a good example is the hotel sector. So it's going to take them a little bit longer to come back and, you know, for tourism and for business travel. But I think other sectors are going to be in long, their long-term relative decline has been accelerated. And think of the high streets and what that has done to them and how many high street stores have gone. And, and, and the way, and a huge amount of investment has gone into what are now legacy sectors. They're in the wrong industry or they're in the wrong place. And so there will be problems for them to deal with, but even more money is gonna be needed into the new sectors, the new industry. So overall, the economy as a whole will come out. Not everybody will come out of it. Uh, some people will struggle to come out this year, but overall we're optimistic. And uh, but we're just, as lenders, we're just cautious around the segmental dispersion, but optimistic for the economy as a whole. Nice, Colin. And Nessa, any kind of you think, preconditions to that mm -hmm. kind of uh, loosening out or, or picking up on, on Colin's uh, sectoral dispersion? Uh, any any particular areas that you think are are of interest? Yeah, I, I think I think Chris and, and Colin touched off the ones that that are going to take longer. So. You know, stickation markets, hopefully that will, uh, I think we've all probably had personal experience of trying to get a regional hotel at the moment, which is great news. Uh, so so hopefully that, that there'll be some who, who start to feel a benefit later on in, in this year. Um, then, you know, 22, 23 is probably, or 23, 24, sorry, is probably what we're looking at for international tourism. Then there's the questions of what will never come back, uh, where, where are the permanent changes? Uh, and we're not yet certain on that. You know, retail is obviously one of the questions. Large scale conferences, um, you know, corporate travel, to what extent will they return? Um, I think from Dublin's perspective, um, you know, our international tourism is pretty much the US and then short haul EU, UK. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, Dublin might uh, experience a recovery maybe quicker than some other cities around the world. But, but one of the other points that I might add is, is the whole concept of an ecosystem, you know, and for so long as certain industries are constrained or restrained in a certain way, uh, others can't get back. So until everything's working, nothing's working. So uh, it, it's that question of the ongoing kind of continuing restrictions into, into the end of it this year, into next year, what are they going to look like? Uh, what impact will they have? Uh, and that whole ecosystem um, for it to work either needs to change uh, or it needs to, to all be working together in, in the same way that it used to for, for all businesses to kind of be able to come back. Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of uh, greater level of interdependencies as opposed to, to, yeah, a, a, to, to a proper track. Um, John, you in terms of the, the thawing out what are we what are we seeing on the on the ground in terms of uh, of transactional activity? Yeah, we're, we're we're certainly seeing a considerable increase in in terms of read and, and credit approvals going through, uh, particularly over the last month. And um, we're, we're expecting to see a very busy second half of the year across all of our clients. Uh, we're we're seeing the deals that have been on hold in a number of sectors are now being picked up again. Uh, MBO and MBI activity is particularly noticeable in that regard, and it seems that shareholders who've been thinking of an exit in, in maybe 2019 and early 2020, that they're, they're now making a move. Uh, sectors where we're seeing particularly good pipeline of deals coming through would, would, would include logistics, food, manufacturing, pharma, uh, tech. Uh, healthcare is also very active, uh, including nursing homes. And particularly, we're seeing a lot of activity on, on the development of primary care centers. So, so we see that various of our fund, private equity, and, and family money clients continue to see that the HSC leases on, on primary care centers as, a, as a, an attractive investment. Um, and then finally, we've, we've been kept busy over the past year on, on residential development projects and, and investment, um, as, as Colin has referred to. And um, with all of the building sites open again now, we can, we can see no, no let up in that area. And, and I suppose our, our fund clients, again, have a, have a continued interest in the, the social housing and local authority 
uh, leases as as a as an investment there too. So okay. all 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 quite positive. Really. Quite positive at one time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the the phrase of the new normal, which along with you're on mute, I think is probably the going to be the <laughs> phrase for 2021 uh, and, and beyond. Um, you know, we're going to be looking now at a withdrawal of, of government and regulatory interventions and support. Uh, and do we think that COVID-19 and that the consequent kind of governmental supports has masked the impact of, of, of Brexit? Is that, is that something that we're seeing? Is it kind of delayed the impact? Chris, do you have a, do you have a view on that? Yeah, COVID has definitely um, masked the impact of Brexit and, and muted the attention being paid to the lingering effects. Um, but, you know, our view is that the adverse impact of Brexit will fall largely on the UK side of the table. Um, well, many of us would have preferred that Brexit didn't happen. It, it has been largely positive for Ireland. Um, outside of the, the short-term disruptions, there's been a transfer of thousands of financial jobs from London, financial services jobs from London to Dublin. Um, and being the last English speaking country in the EU is a, a really good spot for Ireland in terms of attracting future investment and future growth. Um, we're also, you know, seeing uh, the, the supply disruptions as a short-term impact um, linked to COVID, but uh, I think you'll um, see those work themselves out uh, fairly quickly. Of course. And Nessa, just would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with what, what Chris is saying there. Um, I, I think also, you know, Brexit to date has was relatively soft uh, it, it turned out to be a lot of uh, operational and administrative headaches uh, potentially COVID might have even helped a little bit um, the construction lockdown probably um, reduced volumes in the ports say for example to deal with the challenges a little bit uh, I think there's still a lot to play out um, with Brexit uh, you know, the, the, there's there's been a transition of volumes from the UK land bridge, for example, through um, direct from the EU. Um, I think it's been pretty impressive how quickly that has has moved to date. But I'd say there's more to come on that. Um, moving of warehousing from UK hubs to direct warehousing in Ireland, a bit done. Probably a, a more to come on that as well. Um, and I think supply chains as well. There's still a lot of work that is probably going to be done over the next couple of years. Um, to move kind of uh, where products are being sourced. So uh, probably the biggest part of Brexit that's become apparent is there was no cliff edge, but I think there's a lot of structural change that will continue to happen now over the next couple of years in a more measured way uh, in terms of how everybody's doing business. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, uh, it's been a bit of a relief that we didn't have a major Brexit nightmare on top of a, a COVID nightmare. Double trouble, double trouble. Yeah. And, and Colin, in terms of that new normal, uh, what's the, the outlook for foreign investors? Do you think? So the first thing about the new normal, and I'm glad you're using that expression, is that we're not going back to normal. Nobody should talk about going back to normal. 2019 is dead and gone, and we won't return to it. We're jumping forward five years or seven years in terms of the acceleration and the trends that we've had in terms of things like working from home or online shopping. These things are already happening. They're just a massive push forward. Um, so the, I actually think the new normal is going to involve one of two things. It's going to involve a combination of the long term impact of um, uh, uh, COVID, but also it's going to involve the upcoming battle against climate change. And we, we were transfixed with Brexit for the last four years. Brexit doesn't impact the world. And Brexit, as it's happening, we've seen now, Brexit hasn't even impacted whole economies. It's impacted individual corporates and individual sectors, and it's been a hassle. And, it, and there will still be difficulties with it, but it's not a survival issue. Climate change is a survival issue. So the new normal is we're just about to launch straight into 
30 years of dealing with climate change. And so for us, the new normal is going to be a combination of the lasting impact of the pandemic and all of the changes in the financing and the investment that will be needed to tackle climate change. And in five years' time, I would be surprised if anybody even mentioned Brexit. Uh, in two years' time, we'll be surprised if anybody mentions it. We will be transfixed with all of the legacy infrastructure in polluting industries and it's in the wrong place and the wrong activity and all of the money that is needed for new sectors, new economies, etc. And I'm, I'm not convinced Brexit is going to be a lasting issue. Other people will talk about it in two years' time. So that's what I think. The new normal is climate change, which is a much, much bigger issue, and the pandemic. Thanks, Colin. This was <clears throat> in Ireland, we had the, the pandemic, and, and, and we had uh, Brexit. And as if that wasn't enough, we then have two significant uh, banks departing uh, departing the market. So with Ulster Bank and KBC's announcements uh, during the course of the year. Um, Nessa, what do, what do you think the likely impact of, of their departure is? I'm, I'm obviously going to be biased and say no issue whatsoever. There's plenty of, plenty of funds out there in the market. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously it does reduce competition and, and you know, Ulster Bank in particular was a very broad based uh, provider into the market. Um, but I suppose in, in mitigation, two points, I, I think. One is that the, the banks uh, that are in the Irish market now are very well capitalized and have balance sheets that they're looking to deploy. So there, there is adequate uh, capital there for, for plenty of lending. The other the other mitigation is the Irish funding market has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. And um, there's a very, very diverse range of funding options as um, Chris and uh, will, will, will I'm sure um, attest to um, and Colin, but the funding market, we now have operators across the full spectrum, debt to equity, absolutely everything in between. So I think there are plenty of options there uh, for businesses and plenty of funding solutions. Slightly less conflicted, but possibly not too much. Chris, well, what's your what's your thought? Well, e even before the departure of Ulster and KBC, the Irish banking sector had largely retreated from its role as the primary provider of credit to both property and SMEs. There are exceptions, and as Nessa knows, we successfully partnered with her colleagues at AIB on a number of loans. Um, but generally speaking, you know, banking capacity for both from in both sectors is well below uh, those sectors' requirements for debt finance. So, um, you know that that creates constraints. Uh, some alternative lenders that have been active in the Irish market have also lost their backing. Um, but property finance markets are dynamic, um, and this ecosystem with alternative lenders and international banks and domestic banks uh, will, uh, you know, create new competitors, it, it will create uh, new uh, participants in the market that will emerge later in the year and in future years. Um, we'll see uh, new alternative lenders get established um, and, and the existing alternative lenders secure new sources of funds. Um, there are also a lot more banks in London uh, willing to consider warehouse lines, which is loan on loan finance. Um, which helps uh, create new uh, alternative lenders and bring more money into the into the system. So we, it will it, it will inevitably find a balance. Thanks, Chris. And Connor, did you uh, have you seen much impact here, or, or what? What what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I mean, the exit of, of KBC and, and Ulster Bank it's certainly going to present opportunities. Uh, for our remaining kind of domestic banks and indeed non-bank lenders in the Irish market as well. But I think it's, I think it's important to remember there, there will be challenges, I, I suppose, particularly for, for the domestic banks. I mean, I, I think it's likely that, you know, putting together club deals or getting syndications done will be a little bit more difficult for our remaining domestic banks as you like their, their pool of potential Irish partners shrinks, but that will bring with it new opportunities to partner with, you know, uh, non-Irish and, and, and uh, lenders and lenders from far, farther afield who perhaps haven't been as active in this space as they have been up to now. So uh, opportunities and challenges, I think, alike. Thanks, Colin. 
moving on maybe then to the impact of changing work practices and, and, and flexibility and remote working we all remember back to uh march of last year as we grabbed our laptops and went home only, only never to return again um so the impact there on sort of demand for offices type of resi development and you know service providers colin what what's your what's your view of that impact in the kind of the medium to longer term but again, the trend has been accelerated. You know, there was already the start of people's beginning to work from home. And now that has just been massively accelerated. Companies right across the board now are talking about uh, their employees returning to the office. But again and again, they're saying three days a week, four days a week. And so it's difficult to see for the largest corporate employers that their office is getting back to 100% occupancy for years to come. I think for the second and third tier offices, we've reached peak office. Uh, 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 and it's difficult to imagine these second or third tier offices staffed with armies of people doing fundamentally clerical work, uh, uh, getting, back to nor getting back to where they were. I think what the pandemic has shown is that not everybody needs to be in the office all of the time. And so you can take out those costs. And then the next thing that will happen is I think that it's going to spur the adoption of artificial intelligence to take out a lot of clerical jobs. So I think for in terms of how we work, there will be more people working from home. There will be fewer people in office areas, which will impact businesses in those areas. Uh, um, I think prime offices will still be needed, but people are already changing the designs of the offices more uh, 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 welfare areas in the building or more breakout areas. I, I speak to people, the office designs are changing. I think that second and third tier offices, uh, uh, I, I have little confidence that they're going to bounce back. Uh, I would be quite skeptical about it. I think that many of them will certainly will become surface to requirements in the coming years. As uh, large companies look to cut costs, they're going to firstly get rid of the rent. And then I hate to say it, but a lot of them also will get rid of the employees where they can replace them with AI. Chris, in terms of the impact on offices and, and, and on Resi, what, what do you what do you see? Uh, the, the pandemic has definitely changed the demand for office, but I think the net impact is still to be determined. Uh, one of the trends that is likely to turn is uh, office requirements often looked for increased density uh, over the past 10 years. And, and that increased density um, will create challenges going forward. So we're probably going to see uh, more work from home, definitely going to see more work from home, but we're also going to see office occupiers look to add more breakout space, more space to do uh, Zoom calls or, or other uh, activities like that. Um, so, so space requirements outside of uh, space for desks um, we've been a major source of development finance for speculative office development um, in Dublin and elsewhere. Um, so the changes have definitely made us more cautious in our approach. Um, but, you know, I think there's still going to be a strong demand for modern, high quality, sustainable office space generally. Uh, I'd, I'd agree with Colin's uh, comments about the second and third tier um, being potentially troubled, but we're still confident in the schemes that we backed uh, that they'll deliver the space that that office occupiers require going forward. And uh, yeah, so in terms of the office, I heard somebody describe, well, look, my, some of my staff have to be more distanced and with yet some of my, when they're in the office, and but some of my staff want to work at home. So I don't know whether I need more space or less space. Are you seeing, are you seeing any of that uh, coming through in AIB? Yeah, AIB ourselves are, are grappling with this one at the moment. Um, like many others, we're, we're moving to a hybrid model, trying to grapple with how you try to combine the best of being in the office with the best of being at home. So uh, it's, it's not as simple as it might sound on paper, um, but uh, in terms of what is the purpose of being in the office, that's one of the questions we're we're, we're, we're challenging ourselves on so it's it's about team meetings and um, it's about collaborative work uh, as Chris mentioned there therefore is the is the configuration of the office right for that uh, who do you have on different days etc 
Um, so I'm sure that that's something that a lot of companies are discussing at the moment. Mind you, I do hear that some of the larger tech companies are now talking about everybody going back to the office. Uh, isn't Netflix I've heard of or something? So maybe that's the next trend. After we all get to grips with working from home, we'll all be going back to the office. So uh, these things change over time. But uh, we're, we're on the office side, we're still seeing uh, reasonable demand indicators. Uh, same as, as, as Chris and Colin have said, there are probably a difference um, in terms of what type of office, um, but uh, and, and demands are changing in terms of configurations. Connor, practically speaking, in terms of what's closing, people being remote, not being in the office or not being available, how is that impacting? Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, John, Hugh and I mentioned at the outset, you know, some of the some of the ways practice has evolved to kind of cope with the pandemic and had started evolving before the pandemic. And I, I, certainly I think most, if not all of those changes uh, are, are here to stay. I mean, there's issues to be addressed for sure. And John, you flagged in particular some of the concerns we have around the use of e-signatures in an Irish context in particular circumstances. But in general terms, I, I think we're already well on our way to, to coping with this new normal, whatever it, it actually ends up looking like. Right. Thanks, Guy. I'm um, just conscious of, of, of time as we approach the uh, 40, 45, uh, 48 minute uh, mark here. Just maybe turning to sustainability uh, and, and, and green lending. Uh, is there increased awareness? Colin, you touched on this as a kind of a, uh, a theme as part of normal as opposed to new normal. Um, ESG used to be a niche theme uh, as recently as two years ago. It, that's changed almost overnight. And uh, within ESG, obviously, there's the environment and there's the social. Uh, um, I think what the pandemic has shown us, it's a real wake-up call to the world. Some, a black swan event can happen that can change your entire way of life. And if that is not a warning call for global uh, climate change, I just don't know what is. And so what we're seeing is, uh, is everything is now focusing on ESG. It's all our investors want to talk about. It's all that we're internally, our senior management are pushing us on it. Massive amounts of investments will need to go into tackling carbonization. And, uh, and we worry about, when we think about Brexit and say, for example, you know, does it impact the ability of you know, the Irish agricultural sector to export agricultural produce to the UK? The bigger question is, what should the Irish agricultural sector look like if we're tackling climate change? And so these issues, they're bigger, bigger issues. And so uh, and what we'll have is billions will have to be invested. Nobody's going to invest recovery money making diesel engines. It's going to go into producing batteries for cars and clean technology. And there's going to be billions of euros invested in retrofitting existing housing stock and existing buildings. None of them, pr practically no building in Ireland pre-2010 was built with reasonable standard of insulation. They all need to be retrofitted. Uh, billions need to be spent on uh, uh, green technologies, on decarbonization. Uh, uh, the pandemic has highlighted the need for housing and has impacted the social issues of people in on the, the houses they can't afford or overcrowded houses. And so I think, Going forward, both of those themes will be huge. Anything connected to ESG, ESG is everything now. And, and as a lender, before we might have looked at it as a nice to have as part of a loan, now it's a massive risk if we don't have it baked into the entire raison d'etre for that. Thanks, Paul. And, 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 and Nessa, in terms of the experience within, within AIB, how, how, is it, how is it manifesting itself in terms of ESG and green? Yeah, well, in AIB have this as an, an absolute cornerstone of our strategy, which so many organizations do now with very uh, high targets and, and ambitions. Um, it, it, the, the work that's underway at the moment, and it is, there's intensive work and it's affecting everybody at this stage. So it, it really is tangible. Um, but it's now about trying to make sure that it's being built into everything, that it's very tangible, it's very measurable. Um, so climate risks are being built into all of our evaluation models. Uh, data is being built to assess ESG risk and lending books. 
metrics, disclosures are all being redefined. So um, it is very tangible in terms of what's happening in the organization. Then from the lending perspective, um, we've, we've obviously had a couple of green bonds over the last couple of years investing into green assets. Um, and what's happening now are sustainability linked loans. So this is your general co corporate purposes loans that will have uh, very specific uh, sustainability metrics that will be measured, certified. Um, and those are being built into you know, a wide range of documents now and even being built into as a future proofing of documentation. Um, and also then we're moving towards a social bond as well to cover off the, the other aspect of ESG. So um, absolutely, as Colin says, this is, this is part of how we do business now and um, it's increasing in terms of its impact on, on every decision that we're making um, driven by all our stakeholders and that emphasis getting greater. It's affecting you know, risk weighting, um, our ability to raise capital, ultimate pricing, et cetera. And uh, Chris, obviously there's been recent regulatory uh introduction of, of requirements for investors to disclose and uh, asset managers to disclose their, their thoughts around ESG. How are you seeing that impacting on, 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 on things at Berkeley? Uh, absolutely. The uh, upswing in interest uh, in ESG from our investors has been uh, astounding over the past few months. Um, we're also, you know, hearing from lawyers and other advisors, we're seeing uh, ESG and in, in, uh, occupier requirements. Uh, we see governments looking at regulations in line with their net zero carbon goals. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to process all this information. We put together a working group within Fairfield Real Estate Finance to try and absorb the, the deluge of ESG input and convert it into an actionable plan um, in regard to both our lending decisions and how we operate as a business. The, the short-term impact is, as Colin put it, defensive. Um, you know, we want to avoid lending secured by collateral where ESG considerations might adversely impact our sponsor's ability to let the property, sell the property, or refinance the property. Um, and this is, you know, not necessarily going to be rigorous criteria based because we don't have that established framework. It's going to be some guesswork at the start. Um, in the medium term, though, we're, we're trying to find a way to be more proactive on this, to develop and implement ESG ratings uh, and due diligence, due diligence approach to future-proof uh, our, our lending, uh, offer incentives for improved ESG performance, and improve, uh, you know, change our own processes and operations to improve the ESG profile of our business. Um, we did uh, on this front just launch uh, a joint lending initiatives with uh, Initiative Ireland, um, which will provide development finance focused on affordable and so social housing sectors and all those homes will be uh, energy efficient as well. So uh, the program has the capacity to fund uh, 5,000 new homes in Ireland. Um, and you know, given uh, the ESG focus, we think that's a good place to be. Thanks, Chris. John Hugh, I take it that you are one of the lawyers who sent uh, Chris a link to an ESG webinar. <laughs> even, no if doubt, no doubt. even if yeah. you weren't, uh, maybe can you give us a, some, some, some input yeah. in terms of yeah, what you've seen? Absolutely. Yeah, look, as the other speakers have identified, uh, ESG has been the focus of a lot of discussion in recent years, but we're, we're really now seeing a, a new impetus in terms of both ESG investment and financings. Uh, we've seen significant increase in, in activity on green finance and sustainability linked finance. Uh, but as Ness has identified, it's it principally, in, in our experience, been around the sustainability linked financing side. Um, for instance, we've seen various financings of construction projects linked to lowering environmental impacts. Uh, and we've also recently completed a financing uh, of a state utilities company linked to lower use of fossil fuels. Um, while, while historically or you know, on earlier financings, uh, self-certification had been a feature, we've seen this tighten up considerably. Uh, Third-party rating agencies and certifiers are, are now generally being used by lenders. Uh, and we're seeing that lenders seem to be much more focused now on, on meeting the criteria uh, that, that, that they need to attract ESG funding and investment for their lending. 
Um, so yeah, certainly, certainly after a lot of talk, I think definite, definite changes afoot. Great. Thanks a million. Um, just now we're, we're, we're just coming up to the hour mark, so I might just turn to a couple of questions um, that we have from, from the floor and maybe look for short, uh, short answers like the starter for, for, uh, for 10 questions. Uh, the main challenges and opportunities uh, within the Irish uh, lending market. Uh, Nessa, anything on that? Yeah, possibly repeating a couple of the points from earlier um, it's it's managing that divergence between the different sectors the different experiences they're having so uh, challenge on one side liquidity and um, opportunity on the other with pent-up demand and uh, and high performance and also again that sort of return to the full ecosystem that's needed for everything to start working again thank you chris uh, our focus in the near term is is going to be monitoring how uh, the shortages post pandemic uh, affect our developments and and the costs there. Um, that's a a big concern in the short term. Hopefully, uh, the supply chains will get moving and uh, the prices will uh, return to normal levels. Right. Colin, challenges and opportunities. And uh, the biggest opportunity is going to be in ESG lending in all of its forms, you know, climate change and you know, affordable housing for the social issues. Uh, the challenge is at the economy wide level, it's just high levels of indebtedness at the sovereign level but, and for some borrowers. And for us as a lender, our, and one of the challenges we have is, is trying to get up to speed on ESG. Uh, the environmental issues, lending into properties, how are they heating themselves? How is the energy? Well, a lot of these things haven't been mapped out yet properly. And we're trying to make these lending decisions today. So that is a challenge for us. We're, you know, we can't say we'll only finance to build new homes once everything's been worked out in five years time. You know, so that is a challenge for us now that we're trying to deal with. Great. And in... Final, final question, and there's been a lot of talk about dispersion. I see a, a question here from, from the floor. Uh, winners and losers. Uh, if you have to pick one, or two, let's say two of each, two winners and two losers in terms of sectors. Uh, Nessa, we'll give you first go, and we'll see if the others can come up with another two. Of yeah, I'm glad I'm, I'm going first. We might all have the same. Uh, uh, Losers, uh, retail, um, and I hope only temporary losers and um, the hotel sector and, and pubs and restaurants, uh, winners, tech companies. Um, yeah, leave it at that. Right. Colin? I can add a winner in logistics and everything to do with supply chain. Uh, I'm not sure I have another loser to add. I mean, I think is that if you have high concentrations of offices, people who rely on footfall in those areas, they did their business plans on 100% footfall, not 80% footfall. And so they, I know retail is an obvious one, but if you've got businesses in office areas, they may struggle for a while. Uh, uh, that's just a, a possible, possible loser to that. And uh, Chris, and the expectation and hope that uh, Colin was right around logistics allowing supply chains to get moving quickly for you any any views yeah i'll do two two different winners um one is lab space uh and we have a an investment uh, it's a loan to a uh, oxford technology park which provides lab space it's going very well and then uh work from near home offices uh for people who don't have the space uh at home to work from but but need something want to do something other than go into the center of town that's not necessarily a big uh, thing in Dublin where things are walkable, but it'll be a big thing in, in places like London. Um, and then two losers, I, I think, it, just not to repeat, but CBD retail and, and CBD office, the, the center of towns are, are definitely going to see less activity uh, in the near term. Great. Well, uh, being true to our word, we're, we're just on 59 minutes, which hopefully means that uh, We've managed everybody's time schedules for the day as, as well as we could. Um, I'd like to thank the, the panel very much for their insights, which uh, I hope everybody has found uh, of interest. Thank you all for your attendance, your questions and your participation. 
I do hope each of you bring something away from the session and uh, naturally, if you've got subsequent questions, please do, do reach out. We'd be happy to assist in any way we can. So with that, uh, thanks again to our panelists and uh, I'll hand you back to Harvey. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, we'd just like to say a final thank you to all the panelists for taking the time to join and share your insight. And also a thank you for Mark, um, to Mark for hosting such an insightful discussion. I'm sure the viewers might want to view it again because um, there was a lot of content there. So they'll be happy to know it'll be loaded on our on-demand site in a couple of days. So you'll be able to revisit that. With that said, thank you everyone who attended.